Right, so second class on the business of entertainment and media ownership, and today we'll try to go through as much of the relevant textbook material as we can. And thank you, Jody. I think we'll only have one person, okay? And that'll be Tony. Tony, we have a microphone for you whenever you're, whenever it's time. No, no. We'll have to turn it on. Yeah. So uh, there's, uh, I'll just begin, Tony, and you give me a wave when, uh, yeah, when things are looking more. good. Okay. So uh, uh, the first part of this chapter concerns business. There's, there's a ton of stuff lumped into this chapter, of course. Mm -hmm. which makes it more challenging to find our way through it. But the, the first is relatively um, uh, straightforward. The first section is on different business models that the uh, broadcast industry has used over the years. And we learned about some of this in our history uh, you know, sections and some later on in video. So it's a, it's a bit of a recap, uh, but there's some new stuff in here too. This just basically lets us know that a number of business models were used starting in 1920. So before even uh, broadcasting got the notion that it could be a mass medium, which would be supplying entertainment and information to large mass audiences, there was the idea of the person-to-person uh, 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 -person type of model, which uh, would have, you know, um, <clears throat> we wouldn't have broadcasting as we know it today if that was uh, where we stopped. But no, uh, broadcasters continued. They floated the idea of a per set tax model, which still goes on, for instance, in England. You have to have a license to uh, have a radio, and that's basically just to get a certain small amount of money out of you, which goes to financing the public broadcaster, the BBC. Uh, so there, some countries do have a, a kind of per set uh, tax or, or something like that. Or rent, do they, does England have a rent on it instead, instead of per set? It's called a tax, and oh, so they just, okay. you know, when you, you need, a, you need a, a license, when you get your TV or your radio, you just pay that, and uh, that goes to the BBC. Uh, <clears throat> government subsidy, that would still explain partly how NPR and the Corporation for Public Broadcast do get some money from government subsidy. Um, but most of our stations are privately owned, including the public uh, radio stations and television stations are, are uh, locally owned nonprofits. They're not owned by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting or National Public Radio. Um, and then, you know, the toll broadcasting model, uh, which occurred to, uh, um, to broadcasters as the mass media aspect of uh, radio took off, they realized, well, we can get advertising, right? So early advertising was called toll broadcasting. And, uh, you know, they would be the equivalent of today's infomercials. This is basically uh, the broadcaster offers a channel for rent and you rent it uh, and they charge you a toll to get on there. And uh, if you're watching, you know, 30 minute shows after midnight on Cron, you're basically seeing a today's version of toll broadcasting, which is a, we'll, we'll sell you some time on that channel and you can put a program up there and uh, so early infomercials were, you know, 10 minutes for a real estate developer or something. And current infomercials are sometimes kind of hilarious, unintentionally, you know, got stomach cruncher videos and things like that. <laughs> so it's basically when, when the uh, local TV station finds it more profitable to rent time to a single advertiser, than to license a show to put up there and sell advertising around it. So as you know, the overnight time periods are, you don't, you don't get a big audience. That's why radio you know, minutes are very cheap overnight. Same thing on TV, you don't get a huge audience. So it's, it's basically a business call by the local station as to whether they want to you know, license a, an old rerun and put it up there uh, and sell advertising, or maybe it just makes more sense to sell the time to, you know, an infomercial person. So that's toll broadcasting in its historical and current version. You know, you pay money to get on there. 
sponsorship model. I mean, again, that brings us to how a lot of shows are financed and, and stations are financed and in public media. So you go out and you get sponsors. Uh, but this would actually, you know, relate back to the way that a lot of shows were financed in the 40s and 50s, including I Love Lucy. We saw some clips from there where, uh, you know, a corporate sponsor would actually pay to produce the show and that show would be entirely, uh, you know, dedicated to uh, entertaining the audience and putting forward that particular sponsor's uh, brand. Anyone remember why that was viewed as uh, maybe not as interesting as the spot advertising model? A couple of reasons you could think of. Why would why would be dedicating a show to a single sponsor or having a single sponsor pay for a show? Why would that be less attractive to a broadcaster or a sponsor than the spot advertising method? Oh yeah, I mean you really limit your revenue by doing that. Having one versus many who want to uh, <clears throat> advertise on your channels. I mean, the more gotcha. the barrier, the okay. more money. So definitely it's in feminine. the in the spot advertising model, you can sell more spots and in fact make them even shorter and shorter and sell them for more and more. Right. So you'll make more money that way. And JP had a hand up? I was thinking maybe it would sound like you're biased. Biased. If it was a news program. Right? Yeah, it's the CBS News Hour from you know the Trump administration, sponsored by the White House or something. That probably wouldn't work. <laughs> they didn't go there. But yeah, I, th I think they actually took care to make sure that their news programming didn't actually uh, work on a sponsorship model. Because that's a good point. It would make it a bias. John? Um, would it maybe uh, take away some of the creative control um, or content control? That's a good if, point. Uh, if yeah. the whole program is dedicated to one sponsor, then do they have more say over the whole? That's a good point. Yeah, especially back in the day, the you know advertising agencies basically were you know being paid directly by the sponsor to create a show for the sponsor. So I imagine they'd probably have more power directly over content than they do now. Yeah, I guess the other thing that comes up is what if the show is canceled? What if it's a flop? Do you lose your sponsor because the show that they were sponsoring just tanked versus uh, you know, uh, the spot advertising model where you sell 60 second messages on a show. Uh, if the show goes under, you can simply switch over to another show and hope that it gets a reasonable sized audience. And then you can keep running the same spots for those same advertisers on, on another show. You know? Hey, Myra. So that, uh, that was maybe another reason to go to spot advertising too, is just that uh, uh, <clears throat> sponsors maybe preferred to have um, the ability to uh, be on a lot of different shows uh, and follow the audience versus uh, the sponsorship model where you'd really invest everything into being, you know, uh, creating a show and hoping that it took off and got a lot of, a lot of interest. Maybe it wouldn't. And then it wouldn't be as interesting to you as the spot advertising model. Cool. Um, and then the subscription model, which is, um, you know, we're seeing that uh, with the rise of cable, of course, and original shows that were presented on cable. Um, subscriptions became very, very familiar. You have to subscribe to get into the cable system, and then you have to subscribe to get your premium cable channels like HBO. So sometimes two levels of subscription. <laughs> And then if we're talking over the top uh, or just online video, I mean, you, you know, your Netflix subscription follows this uh, type, of, uh, type of model. And uh, <clears throat> very different challenges, by the way, um, versus uh, a, a regular broadcaster working with the ad spot, the spot advertising model, like a network, obviously very tied to its ratings on a, you know, week by week basis. If the, if the show's screening every week, you know, you're really watching the rating numbers to, uh, it impacts the, you know, the, the ad sales, it impacts the you know, survival of the show. Versus a subscription model like HBO, um, what they're constantly looking for is there, there are always people coming into HBO and leaving HBO as a subscription service. We're not talking about the online options now, but just, you know, plain old HBO which a cable operator can choose to even give away. You know, Comcast can say, you know, sign up for another six months 
and we'll give you HBO for free. Uh, so clearly, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's uh, a lot of flexibility, but one drive is to get people coming into the service, keep on subscribing, because people are constantly leaving. So in the business, they call that churn. Those, some are going out, you want some to come in to replace them, otherwise your numbers fall. Now, the individual show doesn't matter to you much as much as getting that churn happening. So that's why you may have a show like Game of Thrones, which is, you know, it could do very well in any situation. But you may also just be launching shows with big stars and lots of visibility just to say, hey, new show on HBO, got to subscribe to see it. You know, get people churning in to replace those who are churning out, you know. It doesn't really matter whether the show survives, it does great or not. It's as, as if it just gets people to subscribe early on, that's good. So you'll see a lot of high profile shows go off after two or three years and it doesn't matter so much because what they just want is getting new subscribers. And Olive has a comment? Yes, um, aren't they, uh, like for instance, I heard that T-Mobile is giving uh, away Netflix for free if you sign up with T-Mobile. I noticed that that's- For life. For life, yeah. Oh, for yeah. life, really? <laughs> oh. I noticed, do, do companies like that create contracts with each other to kind of help build up their own image of yeah, yeah. I mean, they would. And probably T-Mobile would say, I want to do a promotion to Ted Sarandos. And he'd say, OK, well, you know, we'll give you uh, two bucks off on every subscription and you pay the rest for that promotion. You know, so they probably still make some money, Netflix per subscriber, but less. Mm -hmm. uh, Hulu or yeah. yeah, that's possible. And again, Netflix, Netflix, you know, they, they want to show growth, too. I mean, that's that's another thing. Remember. There's always kind of bottom line operational profit from any one of these companies. And then those that are, um, you know, publicly traded on the stock market, uh, there's, there's a whole other dimension, which is how's your stock doing? You know, you may not be that profitable in terms of your operations. So you're, you know, you may be spending billions of dollars on programming and getting, you know, slightly less billions of dollars through subscriptions. But what if your stock is continually soaring and soaring and making more and more money? You're still doing well, even if you know operationally you're not making that much profit. Uh, in terms of your stock value, it's going up, and you know everybody who's important in the company has a piece of that, and uh, and the company eventually will get sold based on that. So it's a second, you know, a second but very large concern for any media business. How's your stock doing if you're publicly? Uh, traded, you know, so that's something too. So have we run out? We've run out of uh, yeah. We've run out of business models. So as you can see, they all kind of make sense, and we've discussed them all. So uh, that's one one piece of this chapter, which is uh, uh, something that uh, is still relevant, but goes back to the history. Um, Tony, do you want to do your news? Your news <coughs> bit. So I'm gonna turn this on, and I'm sure Jody's. Ready for you. Tony, apparently you have to talk very close to the microphone, and everybody had about a minute. So, okay. a minute or two, yeah. Okay. Some people went over. And by the way, X is the spot. You're supposed to stand okay. here. All right, I'll get you. <laughs> I shall, I shall. Do I have to press anything or just? It's already on. You have to speak with a mic like right next to your mouth, though. That's Good morning. That's it. BET Channel makes Asia debut with a launch in Korea. I was really excited about this, and I'm just like, wow, BET is really booming, you know? Um, South Korea has become the first territory in Asia um, that the BET Channel has launched. Uh, BET is formerly known as Black Entertainment Television, which I really grew up on. And uh, I've just seen this uh, station evolve, so that's why I wanted to do the news on it. And um, learning now how they've expanded. And basically, their expansion, their goal is really um, to expand their portfolio uh, of adult targeted brands, you know, shows like Being Mary Jane, you know. Um, and then. They also want to find a fan base amongst Korean youth, um, which 
has really enabled them to go internationally because their interest is uh, that what international youth have with American youth here in common is, is fashion. You know, they're, they're, we're trendsetters here. So with the BET Awards, you know, you have all the celebrities there, you have all the fashion there. Um, so BET really does their programming right. Um, again, their new focus is uh, branching out now to the Asian community, doing that hip hop thing. So they have hip hop awards, BET awards, every kind of facet of entertainment and fashion that one from any age, you know, any age group can really, really uh, get involved in. Again, you know, I'm in my 50s and so uh, I'm a BET guru, right? <laughs> I just do it. I do it. I mean, I, I'm totally entertained. So I'm really proud. Um, BET is a program. Uh, they're owned by Viacom. Uh, and Viacom brings you Nick and um, other channels like that in terms of family entertainment. Um, so yeah, that's my news. All right. BET. Turn this off. I hope it doesn't create a huge... All right. So last class we talked a bit about the, the soap opera that um, that Viacom became, but that's that's good solid business news that they're trying to expand their markets and their reach. And, and I think you're quite right that uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of what they have to offer is cultural. It's know? cultural. It's, yes, it's a unique cultural focus that nonetheless has you know a global audience interested in it. So. I wonder if we'll see their programming kind of adjust to, you know, take more account of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We see. We'll see. We see. All right. Um, there's much more material in this chapter on, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on um, on uh, the interrelationship between the different parts of the broadcasting mm -hmm. business. And here's a star model, which. Uh, uh, talks about uh, some of the different players that are involved. And so all of the previous slides, we'll run back there and try to hit the highlights from those slides, but they're all kind of motivated by uh, the, the, this, this model of the broadcasting environment, um, you know, where you've got local stations really as the anchor point of both the radio and the television business with the new digital upstarts, we called them last class, as a kind of a planet out here, the internet video delivery services, and we could add in there the online music services as well, which are expanding the options for uh, um, uh, audiences, yeah. uh, but remain kind of outside of the purview of the FCC, right? The regulator, which is an important part of this chapter, uh, the regulator, uh, its mandate, you know, being to uh, uh, um, to work with the broadcast industry based on the logic that uh, the airwaves are a public, um, uh, what you call it, a public, uh, say public property, and uh, so you know the FCC has the right to regulate when things go over the airwaves, but in terms of cabled communication. They, they don't have authority over um, some of that anyway in broadcasting. They stay out of the cable industry and they stay out of uh, the uh, online video and audio industries. So the FCC is you know, sort of the odd, the odd part out of this model. But otherwise, looking around, you know, um, if your, your local TV station or in, in some ways your radio station are dealing with advertisers, of course. If they're using the spot model, they're dealing with producers to make the content that they'll either license or maybe they themselves are now producers with their, you know, if, if their their uh, uh, part part. These are all, as we saw, massive conglomerates, and so uh, you know, a CBS will have they'll be drawing on Paramount as, as part of their production studio. A Fox will be drawing on 20th Century Fox or 21st Century Fox and such. Uh, the networks, you know, which are you know, obviously the affiliation ties there, and there's something in the chapter to talk about with that. They're all after an audience, and syndicators as, as another source of programming uh, apart from networks. And, you know, you could, again, why is syndication connected to internet video delivery services? Because Netflix may go cut a deal with, for instance, the CW and Netflix have 
a three-year agreement where everything produced on the CW will be available afterwards streaming on Netflix. Uh, well, Netflix will also have deals with syndicators for other television shows that they happen to own and have the licensing for now. So uh, that's Can why... Can you give an example of a syndicated uh, show or program? Uh, all of, all of Oprah was syndicated, Dr. Phil syndicated. Um, yeah, let's see, there's a lot of daytime TV is syndicated, but also the hour long dramas and fantasy shows too sometimes go into syndication. So, uh, I mean, I would Google a list of syndicated programs and you yeah. could find out currently what's, what's syndicated. South Park. Mm -hmm. South Park syndicated, yeah, there's a big show. Okay. <laughs> Any others? Shout it out, because I have to back up here. Like game shows? Uh, so, yes, game shows are too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I was actually trying to think of which ones would then appear on a streaming service, but that's even uh, getting friends. further out into the weeds. Yeah. Friends? Friends on Netflix. I, I mean, yeah, it is. Now, as whether their deal is with uh, I mean, it runs the network? TV. Yes, it runs right. on uh, like three different stations. Gotcha. And yeah. Netflix, so they're all over the place. That makes sense. Oh. So, yeah. yeah. Did, did Netflix get it from the same syndicator that the broadcasters did? I don't know. Yeah. It might, might be hard Jeopardy, to find. Jeopardy, Star Trek, Dr. Field. All righty. Boy, we have a lot more to cover than this. Yeah. So, let's look at the report on chain broadcasting. Uh, came up in 1941. Okay. So, uh, uh, the big piece of, uh, of legislation from Congress which obviously established the FCC in 1934 was the Radio Act. And that was the big piece of, of, of legislation that affected broadcasting. In 41, um, the power of the networks began to trouble uh, the local station operators and Congress uh, um, got involved. They felt the networks had too much control over local station programming. Uh, so they stepped in to defend the local uh, uh, stations against the networks who had a lot of power because basically as you affiliated with a network, you guaranteed your success. But on the other hand, you signed these clearance agreements where you would basically you know, have to show everything that the networks gave you and they could of course demand more and more of your time and you'd always have to split revenue with the network. So it would take money away from you conceivably. It was certainly kind of force you to do what they were doing. And, you know, uh, American, um, uh, um, American governance has been sensitive to the power of monopolies, right? In this case, what do we call something that's not a monopoly, but that has several different, a few key players rather than one, right? Monopoly would be like one company dominates all. Do you guys know the name for a situation where three or four or five companies dominate? You have a conglomerate or you have a... It's not quite the word I'm looking for, but it's definitely each of them are conglomerates. It's kind of like oligarchy, but like yeah. the same. It's that? It's oligopoly, oh, right. God. Oligopoly. Oh, word. It's wow. in there. So it's think of after. monopoly, like mono is one. Oli, well, I guess. Oli is many. So oligopoly refers to the domination of, uh, by a few. So in this case, they would be looking at, at that time, NBC and CBS were the two networks, right? And they dominated, they had the potential at least to dominate all of the small businesses that were local stations. Um, and so they made some rules uh, as an affiliate, right? Remember, the affiliate is the local station that signs a contract with the network. So affiliates are allowed to reject some network programs based on a you know, uh, number of criteria, but uh, it's for instance, if something was deemed offensive in their local area, so they have the right. Sorry? So ethical. That might be one, yeah. But they also extended it for you know, business reasons as well. If you couldn't be on the air at that time, you know, then you didn't have to pay a penalty or something because you couldn't show those programs. So that had to be accounted for too. Um, the network was allowed to sell, you know, programs if, if the local station affiliate didn't want them, they could sell them elsewhere. So the network had some protection there. The big thing happened here, though, was that at the time there was only NBC and CBS. And NBC had two networks, the red and the blue, which were actually, uh, they, were, they were named by those colors because uh, in the AT&T map of how they 
sent the signals around the country on long distance lines, one of those networks was colored red and the other was colored blue, but they were both owned by NBC. Congress said, you've got too much power, NBC. You've got to divest of one of those networks. And so uh, they sold the blue network. And that's what became ABC, the American Broadcasting Corporation, which was weak compared to the other networks for a long, long time because they needed uh, affiliates. You know, where, wherever, in whatever market uh, NBC uh, Red was not operating, when they sold blue, the, those stations would jump into NBC and, and be a part of it. So basically what, what became ABC was either the leftovers of the blue network that couldn't jump in and become part of NBC uh, or uh, secondary stations which affiliated afterwards. So those were often lower power stations. Their signals weren't as good. So ABC struggled to get uh, uh, competitive just based on that. So uh, there we go. I mean, another, another indication that uh, there was still a lot of power concentrated in the few, the oligopoly, um, was, you know, Dumont, as we spoke about, was a, a, a network which existed in the 50s briefly. Um, the Dumont company also made cameras, they made televisions for consumers, and they, you know, created a network to make programming for it. Uh, but it was too difficult to make it all go. And again, part of that difficulty was just not enough local stations in every market would affiliate uh, and become part of, uh, of, of a, a, a Dumont network. So that was, uh, that was difficult. Um, part of the interest in becoming an affiliate, and we talked about this before, but here's a reminder in business terms, is, uh, you know, if, if you affiliated, you got a check from the network uh, thanking you for airing their, uh, um, their shows. So that was called network compensation, where the network paid the local station uh, to, to air their shows. This is above and beyond the advertising revenue sharing that, that um, still goes on. So uh, <clears throat> network compensation, uh, as we've seen in later years, kind of turned around and uh, uh, now uh, you've got the local stations compensating the networks because the networks are spending so much money on programming uh, that they're asking the local stations, it's like, hey, help us pay for all these NFL games because they're costing us billions of dollars. So uh, there's reverse network compensation now, but for a long time, it was the network that paid the local station. So that was, that was an important thing. Uh, I'm not saying that all other stuff isn't important. Obviously, Fox launching in the mid-'80s was also a, a big deal because they did manage to pull it off. But I think the textbook mentions they lost, they lost money for five years before they were able to turn a profit in Fox because it was just difficult to do. Um, but the Murdochs had lots of money from uh, their, the rest of their media empire. So they could afford to do that. We talked a little bit about some of the regulations that were put in place to protect local stations from uh, the oligopolistic, <laughs> the domination of, of a few networks, right, which had, which had incredible power. Um, as, a, as cable started uh, to uh, become more and more prevalent, um, local stations had another source of revenue. Uh, they, could, they could get um, uh, retransmission fees from the cable industry as well. So uh, that, that kind of combined with the rise of their original programming meant that the networks had somewhat less power, right? Because now uh, you weren't just necessarily watching ABC, CBS, NBC, you could be watching uh, other you know, cable networks which are emerging and becoming more and more, you know, uh, interesting to audiences. And so there's, there's kind of a, 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 a separation of power there. In addition, the cable operators, the, you know, your Comcasts of the day were also pretty powerful too. As they're growing up, they've got a bigger and bigger base of subscribers. So 
you know, Congress looking at a, a broadcasting industry overall starts to see, okay, it's, there's not just everything concentrated, power concentrated in ABC and C, sorry, NBC and CBS. We've got more powerful entities coming on the scene. Um, so uh, the, uh, you see a certain amount of deregulation happening in the late 70s and then especially with the Reagan administration and you know, a, a different view that the, that Republican administration took of regulation was sort of more, you know, let the business sort it out and the, you know, the public interest and convenience and necessity is uh, less uh, um, uh, important at that time, partly because there are more outlets. And it's not all concentrated in the hands of a few. So uh, deregulation, uh, first of all, we mentioned this before, but the, you know, in terms of content, uh, the fairness doctrine uh, had uh, imposed a relative balance in the, in the programming of both radio and television. If you had talking heads on uh, and they were conservative, you had to follow up very quickly with, uh, with liberal talking heads as well uh, to create a kind of a balance. So they called that the fairness doctrine. Uh, which was eliminated eventually, gave rise to you know very partisan channels like Fox or like MSNBC, uh, you know which no longer have to have a balance, um, and a lot of other stuff. You know you could stop running certain stuff, stop running programming, especially local programming, which was there to serve the community. Um, uh, yeah, that was another big one. There was uh, previously there had been limits on how long, how many commercials you could put into an hour, but now that disappears and basically you can fit as many as your audience will tolerate. Um, duopoly, so and ownership. Okay, this is this is uh, something that we should take a look at. So um, there there were there still are rules as to how many stations you can. Uh, um, and this has uh, evolved, you know, over time. That's the rule of sevens? Yes, originally there was the rule of sevens, that's right. So um, at one point there was something called the rule of sevens, which uh, limited the number of uh, um, television stations or radio stations that you could have. But that is kind of uh, has been revised many times over, and uh, so I just wanted to share with you at least the the current currently what things are are happening. Uh, so uh, first of all, you're not allowed to own a newspaper and a television station in the same market. That still stands unless it's a small market. They'll make exceptions if. You know, you would basically, no one else wants the newspaper locally. So we'll, we'll let you run a TV station and a newspaper if you can't sell it. And it would just disappear if, you, if, if we stopped you from having that kind of uh, pairing. So a, a limitation that still stands. Um, TV is regulated, ownership of TV is regulated based on uh, how much of the population you can reach with all of your holdings in TV. Um, so currently, uh, you're not allowed to reach more than 39% of the US population with your holdings. So what that means is, uh, you know, if you're CBS and you have a lot of owned and operated, operated stations, you, you own them, you operate them in different markets, um, you have to be careful. You know, they, they, the FCC, has totals of the population in each of these DMAs, in these designated market areas. And uh, they'll count them up and say, whoa, you're, you're going, you know, we won't let you buy that station. We won't give you a license for that station because you're, you're reaching 39% of the population already. Um, and so that's, uh, uh, there's some specifics in there regarding whether they're UHF or VHF channels, but, but that, that can holds. Um, yeah, I know. It's amazing. You're not, you're not allowed to own both an ABC and a CBS affiliate in the same market. That's to make sure that one company doesn't come in and, and you know, uh, 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 
uh, sort of corner the advertising market in a in a particular place by owning because these you know these network affiliates are always going to be the four largest stations in any uh, market right so they don't want you to own two of those That's not allowed uh, but you can own more if you own let's say the ABC affiliate and then some some other stations that are not in the top four. So you, can, you can conceivably own several television stations. They just can't be more than one of the top four. Radio ownership, and here there was a huge change. In radio ownership right now, for instance, in our market, because we are in a radio market with 45 or more stations, so any entity can only own up to eight radio stations, no more than five of them in, the, in, a, in an AM or an FM service. So what that means is you could own five FM stations and three AM stations in a big market. Um, and as the markets get smaller, the rules change. So I guess it's complicated. But you know, if you look at iHeartRadio, formerly Clear Channel, you count up the number of stations, they have eight stations here because they're not allowed to own more, or they probably would have. So, uh, so those are the current rules. There, uh, there is no cap on how many stations you can own across the country. So, you, you know, you're, you're limited to eight in these big markets, but there are a couple of hundred markets across the United States. So you can build up a pretty large number of stations. And Clear Channel, um, when, when this uh, rule uh, came in, and the, the, you know, that particular rule was in the mid-90s with the Telecommunications Act, Clear Channel went on a buying spree and eventually had 1,200 radio stations across the country. Um, they took on a lot of debt, and then the radio industry started not doing too well, and the economy itself really plummeted in 2008, 2009, and they had trouble paying all the loans that they had taken out to buy those stations. So they started selling their, they sold 600 stations uh, just in order to pay, pay the bills, basically. So it, that was a, a difficult time in their history. And all of, all of the uh, uh, station groups bought a lot of radio stations based on that. So, um, you know, um, takeaway from that is there, there have been extensive rules about how many stations you can own, uh, what kind of combination of stations you can own within one industry or um, uh, within one market. And uh, they are regulated differently. But what you could see is uh, the, the big broadcast conglomerates trying always to push that. At one point, the FCC was willing to give television uh, owners 45% cap. Right now it's 39, right? But there was such public outcry about that that they walked it back to 39 because they got a lot of pushback that um, that wasn't good for the diversity of media ownership to allow them to reach that, that many. There's our model. So let's see, we've touched on uh, a good deal about how the FCC or you know Congress, which is you know, more broadly has made laws about broadcasting, how they've dealt with it, and how that's impacted networks, producers, advertisers, and stuff. Telecommunications Act, 1996. Let's see here. Well, uh, let's just take a little mental break from all the PowerPoints for a second and check out something that uh, was posted last night in the New York Times. Um, in AT&T deal, government action catches up with Trump rhetoric. And so, um, as our uh, presenters uh, were talking about yesterday, uh, or last class, not yesterday, a couple days ago, um, <clears throat> AT&T is uh, uh, currently uh, trying to buy Time Warner. Uh, so, uh, uh, they've done this before. By the way, in the 90s, they bought the largest, they bought TCI, which was the largest cable company at the time. They were able to do that, and now they want to buy Time Warner, which uh, uh, while I was digging around about this, uh, I, I found out that Comcast and Time Warner are uh, the, the least appreciated uh, companies out of 400 public listed companies that were looked at. It was kind of funny. 
people tend to hate uh, cable operators. Um, however, so uh, the Justice Department is looking at this, uh, as it always does when a really big merger like this is going to happen. For, again, as we said, the, the US, US governance is concerned with limiting the monopolistic powers or the oligopolistic powers of media, media corporations. Uh, so currently, um, <clears throat> although AT&T and Time Warner would like to make a deal, they need the Justice Department uh, to sign off on it and say that this is not going to put these companies in a position, for instance, to extract you know, unfair advertising rates or something. When they control such a gigantic audience, um, the, the potential for abuse is there. You know, they could say, well, you want to reach our you know, uh, 200 million subscribers, uh, you're going to have to pay us more. So you're putting uh, companies in a uh, in very powerful situation. Uh, and in the last couple of days, well, I mean, this has been, you know, I, I think we have a situation here where uh, the, the media has been watching Trump and his various proclamations or, you know, his, his accusations of fake news um, pointed at CNN um, and a couple other things which appear in the article. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, so w what's coming out right now is the Justice Department uh, has told um, the AT&T &T Time Warner reps um, saying basically you can, uh, we'll, we'll clear this if either you give up DirecTV or you give up Turner Broadcasting, which you know is CNN is a part of Turner Broadcasting. So uh, they haven't apparently given too much of a justification for what they're asking for. So what they're basically saying is, if you give up DirecTV, um, which is really the the main thing that AT and T wants in this deal is they want all of those subscribers because they want uh, to offer an even huger audience to advertisers, right? So they're being told either you give up this, which is basically what you want, right, or you give up this Turner Broadcasting, which is a pretty minor part of the deal, right? So people are asking, well. You know, what you're basically saying is either give up everything you want or give up this little piece, right? So what would you take? You'd probably give up that little piece. But they're not explaining why that little piece is so important to this deal. Like, why is it so much in the public interest that AT&T not own Turner Broadcasting? So they haven't really explained that yet. Um, but what a lot of people are whispering, and this article, you know, tries to get people on, uh, on record, is, uh, uh, you know, is, is that, um, well, the administration doesn't like CNN. They've, President Trump has said that it's fake news and they don't like it. Um, he's also said a bunch of other things, like that NBC should have its network license revoked, which um, is odd because networks don't have a license from the FCC. It's individual stations. Uh, so this article, uh, oh yeah, and he's also, um, uh, in his, again, in his tweets or in his public proclamations said that uh, Amazon better watch out because um, uh, some of the rules about uh, not taxing the internet uh, really ought to be looked at again. Uh, and, and again, people kind of connecting this thinking, well, Amazon owns the Washington Post and the Washington Post has come out with a lot of articles about the Russia scandal. Um, so. Uh, uh, basically, they're, they're looking at uh, uh, Trump's hostile rhetoric towards the media and then looking at this current decision before the, you know, the Justice Department has to make um, and saying, well, uh, you know, it kind of looks, unless the Justice Department tells us why Turner and CNN have to go out of this deal, it really sounds like, you know, just following through on a threat. What do you guys think? Do you think that's fair for an administration to sort of impose those kinds of conditions on a deal? No. Mason, no? Of course not. But they can if they want to. Uh, well, we'll see it on streaming. 
feel like, like you said, it's just because they had to try to make a deal. And uh, he's like that kind of guy. He just, if he wants something and somebody says no, it's going to happen even if it doesn't. Like for, uh, what was it, Turner? For Turner, yeah. It seems like just because. Like if it's not direct TV, it has to be that or that. So yeah. pick, it just seems like they're picking stuff just because. So I feel like yeah. that's how they are. Yeah, well, perhaps they'll come forward with some kind of, uh, you know, explanation. Logistics and money, but I don't know. He just seems kind of like that kind of guy. Right, yeah. And this is how it looks. It, I mean, uh, on the other, you know, the, the, I think the other thing is these, it's media companies which are targeted a lot. They're, I don't think they're happy being told they're fake news and stuff. And I, I think they're, they're sitting there waiting for this story to kind of, go their way in a sense that they're, they're waiting to, you know, for the Justice Department, for just for somebody to say the wrong thing, like, and, and, and for confirmation that this is just kind of political payback or that Trump's attacking his enemies. And, and so far, I don't see it there, actually, but I do see a lot of whispering and I do see, you know, it's kind of like, well, if, if this is such a bad thing for the public interest, why can't you explain why it's so bad that AT&T might own Turner Broadcasting, right? I mean, what's the difference? Turner Broadcasting, if it's sold to somebody else, CNN will still exist, you know? So why shouldn't AT&T have it? Yeah. Well, you said uh, that these concessions are pretty common, right? They, they always but they usually, they, they usually make more sense. Yeah, <laughs> you know? so do you know, like, what are some of the other concessions for large mergers like this? Well, for instance, Comcast NBC, right? So Comcast NBC Universal was a merger about five or six years ago, and they had to, for instance, promise that Comcast would not give preferential treatment for streaming NBC shows or Universal movies, for instance, because Comcast, is, its future business is, is an ISP, right? And so what they could have done is say, basically, we'll give you a great discount on our new streaming service, which has Universal movies and all of NBC's back catalog, and basically, you know, sell that out really cheap and then charge high rates for Netflix or whatever else they could control, you know. So that was that was a big a big guarantee that they had to make that they would treat all, you know, all streaming services equally and, and not, you know, use their library uh, to uh, to sell it cheap. But that makes sense. It, yeah, it, it, there is there's a logic there, you know. It's like let's treat everybody equally because you know, you shouldn't abuse that huge power we're giving you. Let's treat everybody equally. Jonathan? Uh, I think it was uh, 2010 or 11, AT&T was trying to merge with T-Mobile, and that ended up not working out. Does, right. Does that sound familiar? Why, sure. I'm not sure why that sure. It would have just created, you know, you would have had a, a less competition in the, in the mobile space. Okay. Right? It would have been Verizon versus everybody else, <laughs> you know, and that, that didn't look good. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're pretty, you know, for a boring old telephone company, I mean, they're pretty uh, aggressively moving into other businesses. They're the worst. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have them, but why? Oh, my God. I have DirecTV, so if you have that stuff, then everything you have, and if you have, you have to have a phone, uh -huh. your internet, to watch cable, and without any, you have to pay a bundle. Oh. Bundle of different services, right? Like yeah, totally you different. Have a landline to have the internet. Hmm. Versus so. like Comcast, right? Yeah, and that's why I was thinking. I'm like, if the, I would think Comcast would have more people on it because every house I go to, they have Comcast. I never, I don't know anybody who has Direct TV, but I like it because of the menu. Whenever I go on the Comcast menu, I'm like, this is ugly, dude. I need Direct TV, but that's all you're paying for, basically. But AT&T, it's like three hundred, four hundred dollars sometimes. You know, it's up and down. It's crazy. Comcast is trying to get into the phone business. Same thing. Starting <laughs> with the AT&T. Out of curiosity, was Amazon's um, acquisition of Washington Post something recent within the past few years? Or? I'd say so. Yeah, we could. You could look up the exact date, but it's pretty recent. Yeah. Because wasn't Washington Post its own media? Yeah, it was, and and you know all of the newspapers have been losing value and really struggling. Oh. And I I think when Amazon bought it, it almost looked like you know Be Bezos or how do you pronounce his name? Bezos, I guess. It, it, it people seem like it's kind of like almost a charity move, you know, like this hugely successful company 
buys a, you know, a great but struggling newspaper. You know? but, but what Trump is specifically uh, was threatening on Twitter. So I mean, take all of this with a grain of salt, right? The, the, the Justice Department, this is, this is serious stuff. I mean, they can block the sale of Time Warner to AT&T or the deal. But, uh, but you know, a lot, of, <clears throat> a lot of what we're talking about is what Trump was tweeting, which, you know, is, is whatever it is. But uh, uh, it's, I, I mean, you know, it doesn't have the force of the Justice Department holding up the sale. It just is kind of Trump saying what he wishes would be happening. But he was threatening the Washington Post because there are, there are, um, uh, so, so the, the internet currently, uh, there's legislation protecting businesses on the internet from, uh, for instance, double taxation. So like companies have to, uh, you know, like, like if Amazon sells in California, they collect sales tax in California, but they're protected as are all online businesses from additional tax. They can't, someone can't make up and say, well, well you're in e-commerce and we've got a special 10% tax on all e-commerce. So they're protected from that. And so obviously Amazon benefits from that protection, as does every other online business. You know, you can't just make up an e-commerce tax because California wants to, you know, you know, get get some more money in there and they just figured that's a good way to go. So you can't do that. Uh, but what Trump is saying, well, we should take a look at that again, because this of course was voted in, uh, made made permanent. It was conditional to begin with, but it was made permanent a couple of years back. Um, they could always look at that again, and you know, uh, um, Congress could vote again and change that law if they wanted. So you know, there was just Trump tweeting up and sort of shaking a saber and saying, "Well, we could change this. We could do this." Anyway, that's his his various threats are like you know, like the threat of taking away NBC's license is completely off base because NBC doesn't have a license. You know? They don't. Uh, they don't. No, the local stations are licensed by the FCC. Right? NBC affiliates with local stations, but they don't need a <laughs> license from the FCC to be a network. They're, they're just a business. So that's it. He's an old man. He gets things mixed up. Ah, you know, I mean, it's pretty complicated, isn't it? Right? <laughs> Let's, we, can, we can all agree on that. Uh, to own a local station, as we said, you have to be a U.S. citizen. So that's why Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch had to change not be an Australian anymore, become an American to own own those stations for Fox, right? Um, if you're really committed, I mean, do anything. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're a convicted felon, so if you're a convicted felon, you can't undo that, right? So, if you, so you can't own a radio or television station if you're a felon. Uh, so uh, that's that's something. They'll, they'll also look at uh, other things, ownership structure. Programming, by the way, th that is not a condition for getting an FCC license. So if you're a country music station and there's 20 other country music stations in your market, uh, the FCC is not allowed to say, hey, there's too many country stations here and, or whatever else. They still have to give it to you. So programming is left up to the market to decide. The FCC doesn't consider that. Uh, but they do, they do um, increasingly tend to auction off uh, uh, licenses in, in uh, there's very few frequencies left in San Francisco, for instance, where, where you could actually have a radio station. Um, and uh, um, some people that I know, the San Francisco Community Radio and San Francisco Public Press just got what's called a low power FM which was uh, basically a, a competitive process. It wasn't an auction. Uh, they just, they looked at all the different uh, uh, players who asked for this license and chose what they felt were those, those that could most, you know, possibly make a go for it. But at a larger level, commercially, they're more inclined now to auction off stations uh, because they make, they actually, the government makes money that way. Um, they used to do it as a kind of a lottery. If you had only a, a frequency or two becoming available, they would just kind of pick a number out of a hat or something. But now they make, they make uh, companies pay for it. Um, so uh, yeah, we're not gonna talk about construction, but let's move on here. Yeah, I, it used to be a, a greater, a greater uh, point of leverage over broadcasters to uh, deny them their license or a renewal. 
Uh, it was, uh, for instance, if you repeatedly violated programming rules or you didn't uh, comply with the, the pretty uh, stringent requirements for paperwork, like uh, you have to, you know, um, uh, you have to have a station log where all of your um, operating costs are, are put out there, where your, um, you know, the, the different uh, parameters for broadcast is, have to appear in this station log. If you continually break rules, like not having your log available and updated, or you know those kinds of things, they could deny you a license. They basically don't do that anymore. It's like a rubber stamp. Um, so there's, it's, it's, FCC has become weaker in that way. Um, well, let's see here. What else is useful here? Yeah, there's, uh, as we said, there, there are some limitations, right? You can't own uh, two of the top four television stations in a market. You can't own more than eight radio stations in a given market. But there are ways of getting around that. And one of these is a, a local marketing agreement where a, a station owner might nonetheless uh, collaborate with another uh, uh, company and uh, allow that company basically to operate, operate a station on their behalf. So you can, uh, you can respect the rules of the FCC and not have more than, let's say, eight radio stations. But you can still cut an agreement with another uh, uh, ownership group and take control of their station. This, ultimately, what you're basically doing is you're going into business with them. They own the station, but you sign an agreement where you operate it and you keep the money out of it. So these local, local marketing uh, agreements uh, are, are some ways of, of getting around station ownership caps and stuff. Um, <clears throat> duopoly refers to uh, just being able to own any, anything more than a, a, a two stations in a local market area, right? So radio ownership duopoly is, is long past. You can own up to eight and more. Um, two TV stations in the market, so that's where duopoly still is a relevant idea. Uh, so as we said, you can own only one of the top four, and then you can own more of uh, the uh, smaller stations if you want. Um, cross ownership effects, the FCC looks at that. So let's say you own both radio and television. <laughs> They're, before they give you a license for any to hold any more stations, they're going to take a look and say, well, do you operate your own newsroom? Um, let's say you're trying to buy an existing licensee. You know, uh, If you buy this licensee, will you close down that newsroom and basically do everything out of yours, thus reducing the diversity of uh, journalism in your market? Uh, they'll consider that, and they may deny a license just based on that. Sorry, we'd rather give it to these other people because they're making a commitment to keep that other news newsroom open. You know, so so there's there's definitely that, and and they'll look at a uh, um, uh, the level of concentration. Is like, is it a small market with only two three players in it? Then they'll try to favor. Uh, you know, that third party rather than letting the third party just uh, sell and then there'd only be two, right? So they, they, they always try to favor um, uh, a diversity of ownership, definitely. Um, however, the industry is moving towards more and more consolidation. You know, there's prefers diversity. Uh, so given that there's more and more consolidation, that means there are fewer and fewer companies that own these companies, that, that own the local broadcast stations. Um, so um, there's, you know, there's a push from the industry to buy up more and more stations in, you know, station groups. And then there's an attempt by the FCC to limit that because they feel that the more owners you have, the better. And just a side note, you may be wondering, well, why do they want to buy up all these stations? It turned out for Clear Channel, they bought a thousand radio stations and then they owed so much money they had to sell half of them. It wasn't a good deal. Well, it, part of it is just, you know, if you've got a thousand individual stations, they all kind of just are not worth as much as if you 
own 1,000 stations and can sell that. You can go public, sell stock. You know, that's what, that's what Clear Channel did. They, they, you know, bought a whole bunch of stations where they became like a billion dollar property. And then they did an IPO, you know, and, and said, okay, well, buy stock in our huge company. And then it turned out that the underlying value wasn't really there, but that happens pretty often anyway. So, so the push to consolidation is to create really big companies that are the size of Facebook or Google or whatever, so that people will buy stock in them. Uh, and then it's just, sometimes it's hard to make that profitable, you know, on a level that, uh, that can really work for, for, uh, for, for sustaining the business. Um, is all of Uppley an actual term? It is. We haven't run to a slide where, but it is, yeah, oligopoly. Instead of monopoly, oligopoly. Yeah. It is here in the slides somewhere. Uh, and let me just see. I'm, I'm really, oh, yeah, okay. There are certain things to watch out for when you're uh, a local station, especially when you're um, uh, involved in making news, in, in, you know, which all local stations are because that's actually your most profitable local programming. Uh, you got to watch out uh, for uh, the potential for libel or slander, which is all part of a broader category of defamation. Um, so imagine you say something about uh, a politician that they don't like. Uh, they can tweet at you <laughs> angrily, uh, but if they want to take you to court, uh, they'll, they'll uh, um, Try to prove that you have either libeled or slandered them. So it's, if, if to libel means to actually print something bad and untrue and harmful about somebody, to slander them is to say it. Uh, and of course, as a broadcaster, you're saying stuff on the air, so you can be you can slander because it's oral, and you can also uh, libel because it's written down in a script. Jenny. With regard to defamation, I'm thinking about CNN because you brought up the, um, the New York Times article. Yeah. I mean, Trump obviously has endlessly um, deemed CNN fake, fake news. news. Yeah. But as a, I don't like to say it, head in. <laughs> head don't don't say it then. <laughs> Screen yeah. that. I'll finish your thought. Um, uh, he he hasn't taken them to court. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would think if this holds true, doesn't he have grounds to take them to court? I think probably his lawyers are looking at it. And, and so there's a pretty high bar to actually win a slander or a defamation suit, whether it's slander or libel. Uh, one thing is that you, it, the truth has to be on your side. The, the media operation has to have knowingly put forward falsehoods like fake news. And you have to demonstrate that it's harmful to you. So I, I think Trump could maybe demonstrate that it's harmful. But in you know CNN and whoever else he's attacking, they're doing their very best to report the truth. You know he doesn't like it, so he's calling it fake news. But in court, you know the 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 reporters and the editors would have to come forth and they'd have to say, well, this is the information we had based on all of this. And then the courts would say, well. You know, you thought it was true at the time, and you certainly did your due diligence to make sure it was true. So, you know, that's. So he has no, not much of a. He wouldn't win. Yeah, he wouldn't win. And I would assume his lawyers are saying, you know, okay. don't bother, you know, because what you really want is to get your 50% of the country who's on your side thinking you're right, regardless, you know. 30%. Yeah, or, yeah. <laughs> Depending, so so why go to court and you know have you know even the courts say that you're wrong, when if you just tweet your ass off about it, then it'll you know it'll convince the people who are already convinced, and otherwise you you, you won't go on record in some ways. So so uh, there's a you, what you want to do, of course, is you you want to make sure that um, uh, th that you're doing your very best to present true true reporting, and of course we know that reporters can be wrong. Uh, but if you demonstrate, you know, that you're using the techniques correctly, uh, and also you want to wall off opinion from factual reporting. Uh, so that's another aspect of it. You want to, if you have editorial comment, which may offend, slander, or libel someone, you want to make sure that's not presented as news, because then you can get in trouble. So uh, required actual malice, reckless disregard for the truth, 
Uh, so th those are things that if you get involved in that, you could lose this type of case, but the burden of proof is on the person bringing the charge. So Trump would actually have to, if he were going to do this or whoever is going for a defamation suit, would have to prove that um, this is, this is uh, uh, false. So say, for example, the New, York, the New York Times and especially the Washington Post, they have their opinion column. And when they post something in that, I mean, considering it's labeled opinion, Yes. He doesn't have much leverage. Right. At that point, exactly right. Like a blog. You know? <laughs> right. And, and, and you, and you want to make sure that this is pretty clearly marked out. You know, and that's why in our writing, writing for the media class, you know, it's like we're trying to avoid editorializing in the middle of a news story because the two, the two make for bad reporting, but they also leave, leave a news organization open to, you know, those kinds of challenges. Ooh. Does it say there? Yeah. We got oligopoly in there? Where? Consolidation has made the market oh. recently. Oligopolistic. Oh. Oligopolistic. So it is there. Whoops. Back up. How did I move that out there? Okay. So super groups. We've heard of super groups. Um, well, okay. We, uh, we, should, we should cahoot now whether or not we're finished because we don't have much time left. So uh, just before we go into that, I have sent out a, uh, a missive, a, uh, uh, a reminder that we have a quiz coming up next Thursday. Uh, so we'll review in class for the quiz on Tuesday. This is the reminder I sent out. You probably get it in Canvas. Uh, the quiz is on chapter 8, 9, and 10. Uh, if you want to review using the cahoots, there are the pins for the cahoots. Um, and we will review in class on Tuesday about that. So uh, uh, class, uh, the exam, the uh, exam, it's a quiz, be taken in class on Thursday. You can also take it online during the times that we regularly meet for class. Oh yeah, by the way, Jody was saying some folks were, si were wanting to get a hold of the slides. You, you know that uh, uh, the, the PowerPoints are always on campus, right? You just click there and you can see all the uh, many la many layered slides that I <laughs> put up there. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're all from the uh, from the uh, textbook publisher, right? So this is this will be on the quiz, right? And you can review this using those uh, things. I hear to my horror that uh, when streaming, cahoots really don't work because uh, the street there's so much delay in the streaming, you can't really participate in uh, real time. So here we are. We're going to join. Anyone going to play today? Just us. <laughs> Just you folks. Yeah. Doesn't sound like a lot of fun to play online. I'm sorry about that. I thought it would be a great way that we could combine the mobile and the, the distance people. Johnny Bravo's in. Oh, good. All right. A lot of folks joining up. Good. Grammar. <laughs> <laughs> Love these. OK. All right, I'm going to start right away just because I got so many. We're ready. Keep joining if you want. And I'll, I, I, I had too much to sock. The 1941 report on chain broadcasting led to the creation of ABC. True or false? So remember, they took a look at the power of NBC and CBS at the time. They said, oh, NBC, you've got too much power. You've got to give away part of your network. NBC gave away the blue, and it became ABC. The FCC will not grant a license to a convicted felon. True, guys. You can't. If you're a felon, you can't. You also have to be a citizen. You know that. It's, it's hard channel. to get into any business if you're a felon. Yeah, that. True. Whoops. How is that so fast? A 30-minute infomercial for a skincare system is an example of what revenue model? Is it toll broadcasting, subscription-based, spot advertising, or sponsorship? Remember, it's 30 minutes. It's not 30 seconds. It's 30 okay. minutes long. <laughs> toll broadcasting. All right. So remember, back in the day, uh, you could buy time to, for a 10-minute real estate ad, and that was toll broadcasting. An infomercial is toll broadcasting. Is that still true today? The pro uh, infomercial is still toll broadcasting. Toll broadcasting. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Oldie program, the Craft Music Hall, is an example of what? Yes, everybody got that one. Excellent. That's right. Yes, that's sponsorship because Kraft sponsors it. Paying a monthly fee to access Netflix online is an example of what? Yes, 
eight out of eight got subscription-based programming because you pay a monthly fee. Gotcha. Which of the following is not a component of the broadcast star model? Okay, so remember the star model had the local station in the center and then the involved uh, other, other parties were around it. One of those is incorrect. Which one is it? One of those was not bad. It's not bad. It's only, only one person got it wrong. So is the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, would not be a part of the broadcast star model. But the FCC, the audience, and network affiliated stations definitely were. Which of the following would disqualify someone from owning a broadcast station? Well, we know that you can't be a felon, but what else? Okay, whoa, seven folks. Not being, you just having to touch the right place. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Something refers to a station being owned by one company but operated by another. What is that? This one's a little tricky. Yeah. So it's a local. What? Nobody got that? I think you just couldn't see it down here. That's all. So that's the LMA, the local marketing agreement. What that refers to is, okay, you own eight stations. You can't own any more, but you can go to another station owner and say, hey, can I operate that? And we'll split the profits. That's a local marketing agreement. So that, that lets you into having more stations. Making cable companies pay local TV stations for the right to include the local TV signals. Ah, this is a, you learned this before, but you didn't learn it today. <clears throat> so the, the cable operator is required to include in their service the biggest of those local stations. What do you call that rule? Oh, darn. So that is must carry. Okay, whoops. Read. No, 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 no. Making cable companies pay local to Oh, it's paying local. Okay. It is truly retransmission consent. That is correct. So I've messed it up. So must carry is when they have to carry your signal. But the fact that they have to pay you, they pay for retransmission consent. Okay, we'll review that before next class. I'll make a note of that. Yeah, that one we did have to learn today, and we didn't have time. Something refers to a single entity owning more than two stations in a market. However, yes, five people got duopoly. That is correct. So owning more than two, you know, again, a monopoly would be you only have one. Uh, duopoly, you're allowed to have two or more. Owner consolidation led to a media market that is increasingly, right? <laughs> there we go, six. Six people got it, okay? So remember, what this means is that a small number, not just one, but a small number of companies control everything. And consolidation means that everyone's busy buying up everybody else. ATT is going to buy Time Warner and so on and so forth. So that leads to oligopoly. Which of the following is increasingly being used to select broadcast licensees? So you have a few people who want this license. How does the FCC do this lately in order to make some more money off of it? They auction it. That's correct. So auction is the correct one. So this is increasingly, OK? So maybe national, being, being a US citizen has always been the case. And it is not increasingly the case. But auctioning is the way they do it now, more often. It used to be large. <clears throat> this type of defamation occurs when the offending statement is spoken. Slander. OK, six people got it right. right? So remember, libel is when it's written. Slander is defamation when spoken. And how are we doing here? 14 out of 15. The rule that local cable providers include all over the air TV channels in its basic lineup is, in this case, I'll skip it, it's must carry, OK? Must carry is the answer. So you all got your answers in there. Must, that is the correct must carry. I got confused as to which question I was trying to sell to you. Now finally, to defend against libel, broadcasters can demonstrate that the defamatory uh, statements are true. Is that a good defense against uh, libel? Definitely not. OK, five people said it's true. It is. That is true. If you can prove that what you were saying was the truth, then they can't sue you for defamatory statements. You're simply saying the truth. OK, that's it. Thanks. It went five minutes over. And I'll review with you that must carry and retransmission issue. Class. Have a good weekend.